Hello, and welcome everyone to this online program of the American Writers Festival, the inaugural literary event celebrating the American Writers Museum's fifth anniversary. Over the course of the day today, we are welcoming more than 75 authors on five stages at the Chicago Cultural Center, the museum here, and even online with all of you virtually. I'm Kerry Cranston. I'm the president of the American Writers Museum. Just a few short things before we begin. If you like the kinds of programs you're seeing from the AWM, you can join the museum as a member and get advanced notice and special access to upcoming exhibits and events. We hope to see you all in Chicago at our museum in the coming months and at our vir virtual hybrid and in-person programs often. Our book selling partner when we're open and here online is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. You can order today's book from the link displayed on your screen. We'd like to begin this event by acknowledging our presence here on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. Many other tribes, such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee, Sac, and Fox, also called this area home. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We are grateful to all of you watching today for supporting the past, present, and future of American writing. The woman warrior Maxine Hong Kingston's debut memoir of her immigrant American childhood begins with a mother telling her daughter a secret, a story that, like many family stories, is intended to teach a lesson. Kingston's work taught the nation what it meant to her to be Asian American at a time when there were fewer signposts for authors like her to follow. A fierce feminist story that changed American culture, The Woman Warrior is now part of the new Library of America anthology of Kingston's work along with her National Book Award-winning Chinaman, her novel Tripmaster Monkey, his fake book, and a series of essays about everything from Kingston's life in Hawaii to the influence of the beat poets. We are incredibly honored to have Maxine Hong Kingston with us to discuss this new volume of her groundbreaking work, along with the book's editor, Viet Tan Nguyen. He's the author of the Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, The Sympathizer. His other works include The Refugees, Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War, and Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America. He is also Dr. Kingston's former student. I want to welcome you both. Thank you for joining us. Such a delight to be here at the American Writers Museum and with you, Maxine, as well. It's great to see you. Good to see you too, Viet. I, I look forward to this event because I interviewed you when The Sympathizer came out and uh, now it's your turn to ask me the difficult questions. Well, I don't think they'll be too difficult, but first I believe that you'll be, well, first congratulations on the Library of America edition of your work. It's really beautiful. I wish I had brought it with me so I could show it, but, I, uh, but, but I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to be the editor of, uh, of this amazing volume. And I believe you're going to be reading from that for us today. Yes. Oh, actually, what I want to do is to read the first poem that I ever wrote. And I don't think it's in that, uh, uh, that new volume, but I, I just want to read it because it's, uh, it's, when, it, it's when poetry and words and story first came to me. Sam gonga, say gonga, nehoi naya, mahai, cup cup, say girl, yao, say girl, nehoi naya. I wanted to read that in my first language, my original language, uh, when this is my primal language. And, uh, and so I want you all to hear it because then you can see the long journey that I took to be able to write American English. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, speakers of Sayapwa, you could understand it. I, I spoke this dialect of a very small, small minority and uh, and I even played with language when I wrote it because when I wrote this down, uh, I used um, 
I, I, I changed some of the words into a more familiar dialect so more people could get it. Uh, here's the translation. Hey, third grandfather. Hey, fourth grandfather. Where are you going? Horseshoes clippity clopping. Four feet, then four feet. Where are you going? Um, this came to me because uh, my mother would hold me out the window and she would squeeze me, like she's squeezing a song or a poem out of me. And she says, she says, make your grandfathers laugh. And here come my grandfathers. Um, they had two black horses and uh, they, uh, they, they drove a stagecoach. Uh, full of vegetables, and uh, and, uh, and and then I, I would sing this poem to them, and uh, and they did laugh, and uh, it was also interesting to me. You would think that onomatopoeia would be the same anywhere, but uh, translating it, you know, the uh, the Chinese. The horses are going cup, 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 cup. And the, the, uh, the American horses are going clippity clop. Uh, so I'm just saying this because these are some of the things I've had to work with uh, as I, uh, as I uh, went into English. Um, okay, okay, then I would also like to read to you one more thing. And uh, in a way, this is a correction because um, uh, years after, you know, every book that I write, I'm never satisfied. It's, it's not good. I, I make mistakes. And so years later, I thought I, I did not give the right version of the woman warrior. I fooled around with the stories. And uh, so let me, um, let me get, let me translate the woman warrior chant as close as I can to the original, the way I heard it when I was a, a baby, what, the way I heard it when I wrote my own poem and mistakes. Famuglan was a weaver, the way that uh, 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 Penelope, Penelope was a weaver. She's so Decius and Penelope in one. And I, I left that out. Uh, the poem begins with a sound of weaving. Chick, 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 chick. And chick means to weave. It also means to heal and it means to knit. Chick, 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 chick. Fa Muklan is weaving the shuttle through the loom when news of the draft comes. Each family must provide one man to be a soldier in the army, sparing her dear father the wretched life of a soldier. She disguises herself as a man and goes in his stead to war. With heavy armor and her hand-fitting sword, she fights wars. Her horse's hooves pound the earth. She cannot hear the voices of home. She is away long years and many battles, so long a time that her father and mother grow old and die. At the head of her army, giving chase and being chased, she suffers wounds. Blood drips red from the openings of her armor. Her army chasing and being chased passes her home village six times back and forth past her home. But she cannot stop to place offerings on the graves. In terrible battle, General Motlan defeats an enemy and the king proffers rewards. She asks to go home, the war be done. She takes her army to her home village and orders them to wait for her in the square. Indoors, she takes off man's armor. She bathes, dresses herself in pretty silks and reddens her cheeks and lips. 
She upsweeps her long black hair and adorns it with flowers. Presenting herself to the army, she says, I was the general who led you. Now go home. By her voice, the men recognize their general, a beautiful woman. You were our general, a woman. Our general was a woman, a beautiful woman. A woman led us through the war. A woman has led us home. Fa Moglan disbands the army. Return home, farewell, beholding and becoming yin, the feminine, come home from war. Chick, 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 chick. A mistake that I made in The Woman Warrior, and it, this is a big one. I wrote this story as heroic. And when you hear this original version, this is not a war chant. This is a coming home from war chant. The, the life of a soldier is wretched. And the best thing that can happen to anybody is to come home from war. Okay. So thank you for letting me correct my mistakes. That's great. That's great. You know, I, I, uh, I was your student back in 1990. I believe that was when I took my uh, class with you. And uh, now we are here 32 years later. And I, you know, I've gotten older. And it's inevitable that I start thinking about time and, you know, the, the, the changes that have gone on over our lives. And it just occurred to me that now I am probably older than you were when I took a class with you, which puts everything into a different uh, perspective for me as I think about my own students. So I think a lot of the conversation today will be partly retrospective, you know, about your career and about your origins and, and, and your works. And, and you know, partly because you started off with this, this very early poem that you read for us. How old were you when you, when you wrote that? I, I was young enough so that I didn't know about ages, but uh, I think I was about three and I did not write it. I didn't know how to write. Uh, write stories and poetry were always oral. Mm -hmm. And if that carries on uh, the tradition that my mother brought, it's always talk story. And also my father, uh, he memorized uh, Tang Dynasty poetry, and, uh, and it was always oral. I hadn't learned to, I hadn't learned to read or write yet, so I, I think I was about three. Yeah. And speaking of you being my student, I just want to let you uh, know that... Uh, uh, I don't think I taught you anything. I don't think I was a good teacher. I did not even have faith that writing could be taught. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, when I read your work and, uh, or, and, and of the other students too, I, I, it, it was already coming. I, it, it was already in you. And, um, uh, and I, I myself never took writing courses and somehow they would come and you, you have to invent the, 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 the way that the words come. Uh, you, you have, there's so much that, that seems to be inborn. And uh, I don't know that we teachers taught you very much. Maybe the main thing would be just keep going and, and do some more, do some more. Or maybe we could give you some feedback, but I, I'm not even sure that the feedback helps uh, because uh, you, you're gonna write that thing that's already in, in you. You know, I, I just blurred a novel called Activities of Daily Living by Lisa Chen, who was a student in the same class mm -hmm. with you, you know, and you just talked about persistence, for example. Lisa started off as a poet. She has a book of poetry, Mouth, and now she has this novel, which is really amazing. 
um, which is about art and persistence and, you know, like the, 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 the project that is our lives, but also our, our art that takes place over decades. So it's really appropriate, an appropriate novel to think about your own career. But what you're saying is, is I think, absolutely true. It's like, you know, I, I think I have, I'm a teacher, I have, I have students, and I just try to encourage them and get out of their way. And who knows what they're going to be 20 or 30 years from now. But in fact, I'm writing a memoir at the moment, and you're a character in it because oh, that. <laughs> I talk about the seminar that we had together, and of course, I, it was I was a disaster. Uh, but I saved the, the the letter that you wrote me, and I quote from your letter in this memoir. And here we're talking about writing and you know how to how to encourage people and all that. And you know the questions that you that you posed to me, the critique that you leveled at me in that letter was absolutely appropriate. You know, you were saying, "Hey, you're falling asleep every day in class. What's wrong?" You know, maybe, and you're not asking questions of of your fellow students. You're not giving of yourself. That was the content of the letter. And it's a very interesting letter for me to reread because I think you're absolutely right. So my feeling is I did absorb some of that. I mean, it took me like decades to, to really understand what you were saying, but nevertheless, I kept that letter with me in my archives and it stayed with me enough so that I, when I was writing this memoir, I, op I read it again and I thought, this is absolutely perfect. And I really do believe that when we're teachers, we don't know exactly what we're doing to our students. And we won't know maybe in some cases for decades. I'll give you another example. Master Monkey, okay? I read this book when it came out. This is the first edition, hardcover, uh, which I, I must have bought when I was like 20, which is a lot of money for me, okay, at that yeah. time. And I read it, and uh, this was around the, you know, somewhere a little bit before I took your class. And then decades later, I would write The Sympathizer, and then I went back and I reread the I reread Trip Master Monkey Monkey recently, just a few weeks ago, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm actually quoting from Trip Master Monkey in the Sympathizer without knowing it or referencing it, because there are passages in Trip Master Monkey that are about Hollywood's racism against Asian yeah. Americans, for example, which is a major theme of the Sympathizer. And then there's a passage from Trip Master Monkey where Whitman A. Singh has to do the Frank Chin exercise, I believe, of taking a piece of paper, dividing it in two and writing his Eastern and Western attributes on there. And that okay. appears in The Sympathizer as well. So I was not thinking of Tripmaster Monkey when I wrote The Sympathizer, but I'd read it and it stayed with me, I'm sure. And some part of me was just, you know, pouring it back out onto the page. So this is simply a way of saying that you don't know what your influence is. Maybe it did not come from Tripmaster Monkey. I mean, we are both Asians. Uh, we have this huge background and history in our, in our ancestry. And maybe that's in our, uh, our universal consciousness. Uh, oh, speaking of Trip Master Monkey, I, I want to talk about the editing process of this. I just, I, I, I've just glanced at it because I find it unbearable to look at my own writing. But I did look at the uh, the chronology and the and I, I skimmed the uh, the footnotes and this is not like footnotes of anything you've ever read. It's it they're not like scholarly footnotes. It 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 explains the footnotes are so much fun. They explain the jokes that are in Tripmaster Monkey, and. Uh, it, and I, I knew that Tripmaster Monkey is a difficult book, and uh, and I would I I I just made the the jokes that I knew, and 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 reading my work, my my brothers and sisters are the only people that that think that I'm a funny writer, that I'm a comic writer from the very beginning, and uh, so could you just say a little? bit about the editing process. I can't believe what went into this. I will have to confess something, which is that I did almost nothing for this book. Uh, all credit goes to the Library of America and their professional editors for doing all the footnotes and all the selection of the text and everything. I certainly, I, I agreed, hey, all these books are great. They should be in here, all the excerpts. And then, of course, the I, I did proof the, uh, the scholarly footnotes and so on. But, you know, that, you know, the Library of America did a great, great job on, on this book. And then they think they bring someone like me on board, I think, because of my relationship with you as a student and as a writer who's been influenced by you. And I'm, it's my honor to have my name on the book more than anything, more than anything else. But I just want you mentioned about Chipmaster Monkey that I got so much more out of this book now rereading it 
a few weeks ago than I did when I read it as a college student back in 1990 or so, because I understand so much more of this book. You're talking about how in the Library of America edition, there are all these footnotes to explain things. I don't know if I would benefit from the footnotes, but I thought I, I understood so much more about this book after a few decades of maturity and wisdom and experience and so on, but also knowledge about the things that you were writing about in this book, because it is, uh, you know, for those of you who don't, of, in the audience who don't know anything about Chipmaster Monkey, it's about this uh, um, very charismatic, ambitious, young Chinese-American playwright named Whitman A. Singh. Uh, of course, his name is a reference to Walt Whitman, I Sing, America, and so on. Uh, and But it's also a book that is about Chinese-American culture and history and Asian-American culture and history. Reading it again, I did laugh a lot, actually, because I, I recognize all these things that you're talking about. Uh, there's a whole history, for example, in this book of Asian American writers and Asian American literature. You're, you're calling out all your antecedents like Jade Snow Wong and Carlos Bulusan uh, and uh, the, 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 the Eaton sisters from the late 19th century. Um, and so, you know, you were performing uh, not just a novel in this book, but also uh, a work of, of history. And I think of it as one of our examples of the great Asian American novel, Asian in parentheses. You know, it is an Asian American novel. It's also an American novel, great American novel, but one in which Chinese immigrants, Chinese culture, Chinese immigrant culture, Asian American culture is being completely sutured into San Francisco and its history, the Bay Area, Berkeley, and then through all the United States. And it and it also, you know, lays the foundation for what comes later in your career with the fifth book of peace, which I want to talk about too. But let's just talk about Chipmaster Monkey for a moment. I mean, did you think that you were writing the great parenthetically Asian American novel when you were doing it, or how are you envisioning this book? Well, when I started Chipmaster Monkey, I had already finished Woman Warrior and China Man, and I felt that I was writing a, a, a Chinese, my Chinese ancestry, Chinese myth, Chinese uh, uh, poetry, uh, my, my ancestors going way back thousands of years. And, um, and I was also working with Chinese language and also uh, the, the, our, our Chinese accent as we speak English. And, uh, and, and, uh, I was, I, I, I thought I am just stuck in this, this old world. And uh, when am I going to write the great American novel and not a Chinese novel? And, uh, and, uh, and also um, uh, the, the, the time of my youth, which I thought, uh, such a wonderful youth. Uh, there we were, er, er, we were just coming out. People were, they were beatniks and I aspired to be a beatnik, but I was too young, but here comes hippies. And so I wanna be a hippie and, uh, and I wanna write about that time. And, and the, the language of that time was, so uh, wonderful, you know. We would trip out and tune in, and and uh, and uh, and all all of that. Uh, uh, oh, and 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 and, and, uh, and a whole psychedelic world, and and so I wanted to write that, and and it would be American, and. Uh, and I didn't. I didn't want to do a, a, a Chinese flashbacks, and I did not know whether I could do it. Uh, and uh, so, it, it's a uh, uh, yeah. I, I, mean, I it, look back on it, and it was very difficult. It was very hard for me to do that, and mm -hmm. I do not think that I could do it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I. It's the only book I have that's a real novel. It's a it's fiction, and the work of fiction. Uh, it it could be just the way that I 
my psyche, but I am not a natural uh, a fiction writer. It, 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 it took me such a, a, I had to change my state of mind, uh, my imagination, uh, my way of talking. Uh, and uh, it's so much easier for me to write about real people and, uh, and, and actual things. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's a great love letter to this particular time and place, you know, the Berkeley Bay Area of the 1960s, the, this, this particular kind of countercultural generation that apparently does a lot of drugs, from what I could tell from, from the novel, but also, also having a lot of fun and play in a good sense. I mean, Whitman Assing is a playwright. He wants to put on this great play that he's composed, bring all of his friends together. And the play itself and the performance and the actors and the community, all of that, I think, is part of your vision of what art and community and play can accomplish in the face of what people were encountering back then, which is obviously the war in Vietnam, which would become one of the major uh, themes of your of your writing and your life. Uh, but you know, insofar as this is a novel, which I think is a very successful novel, and the fact that it's not about real people, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like there was like references to real people going on in the characters of this book, and you're probably sick and tired of talking about Frank Chin, you know, after all these decades. But this is a retrospective conversation. I'm just wondering. You've been asked this before, but you know, there's a lot. Of, you know, to me, Whitman Assing embodies a lot of Frank Chin characteristics, possibly other people as well. But given, you know, for the audience that doesn't know, you know, the, you know, Frank Chin, one of the other major. Asian American writers, certainly he, he came into his reputation before you did in the 1960s and 1970s. He edited IE and, he, and with along with his collaborators and really helped to put Asian American literature on, into the national conversation. But he really did not like your work, you know, and, this, and the Frank Chin, Maxine Hong Kingston, you know, beef was a big thing for us in the 90s to read about. Now, all these decades later, is there anything you want to say about that? Any kind of final cap you want to put on that conversation? Well, when I look at the overall way that uh, Frank was reading my work, I, I, I see some big differences uh, uh, between us, uh, not just the, uh, accusing me of, uh, of uh, oh, oh he, he, he accused me of oh, uh, demasculating, uh, Asian men, uh, and and that's I, I I know what what where he's coming from is I'm writing a feminist work, and so uh, so I uh, you know I write about the macho culture, but then he sees it as an attack on Asian men. Okay, okay, I get I get that it it can do it, but I just, the book one. Big difference, I think, is that um, uh, I am becoming more and more of a pacifist, and uh, and I and Frank Chin, uh, one of his uh, what would you call it mantras is "da jiang," you know, uh, fight war. Uh, writing is fighting, and. Uh, and so I, I think that that is a big difference that, uh, uh, that we, we clash over. And all the time being a pacifist, I try not to clash. And so in all these books, I, I keep working, even when I am writing about warriors, I, I somehow work in a, a pacifist idea and I, I, I'm sure that Frank uh, sees this as uh, 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 being against what he is for. Um, he also uh, accused me of uh, messing around with our uh, inherited myths. And he's right. I, I, I do not give the correct uh, classical uh, versions uh, I think one of the worst things that I did was uh, uh, I, I talk about, I, I wrote about Famuglan uh, kneeling as her parents carve 
uh, uh, words on her back, dedicating her to uh, to the uh, uh, to China, and uh, okay, that did not happen to Fa Mulan. That that happened to Yu Fei. Uh, he a uh, uh, a man a uh, a warrior, and I just took these two myths and I put them together, and uh, so. You, that's right. I got it wrong, and uh, uh, oh, the the Chinese critics have uh, have also criticized my books for uh, getting the myths wrong. Um, oh, what the Chinese did when they did the translations? They tried to help me out because if I got something wrong, they just deleted it from their edition. Um, but. Uh, but you know, I did that on purpose because uh, when I was writing uh, th those books, I, I, I believe that uh, I believed in myth and in storytelling. And if I could, uh, if I could uh, own a myth, then I could have that power. So I wanted to give women the same powers that Yu Fei had. So I just incorporated his story into to my story. You know, yeah, I mean, Frank Chen is often associated with writing as fighting in the Asian American context, but apparently Muhammad Ali was the one who, who said it. And in fact, I quote Muhammad Ali in my own, in my own context. I'll try not to be too masculine about it though. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, it, I'm speaking about the emasculation of Asian American men, which was already a tired topic at Berkeley in the nineties when I was there. It seems to me in Trip Master Monkey and it's, and uh, in the next book, Fifth Book of Peace where Whitman Asing reappears, uh, you make a very deliberate case for for Whitman Asing's masculinity, you know, but not necessarily maybe the masculinity that Frank Chin wants, because Whitman Asing, like you, becomes a pacifist who sees the work of art as being something that can lead us or try to lead us towards peace. And um, you know, it's one of you know, like I said, the war in Vietnam was, has been a big theme in, in your work. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, one of my favorite stories from from you is from China Men, the brother in Vietnam. Um, I'm assuming it's it's, autobi it's autobiographical about your own brother and and just again to summarize it for the audience, uh, you know your brother decide you know he decides he's going to volunteer for the Navy instead of waiting to get drafted during the war in Vietnam because he feels like being in the Navy he'll have the least opportunity to kill somebody and even if his ship does kill people because of its missiles or whatever, he won't be any more culpable than he would be if he were a civilian in the United States, because part of the point, and it's a really powerful point in that story, is that we're all culpable. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a military industrial complex, in a war machine, all of us, you say in that story, are responsible because we pay our taxes, because of our consumerist lifestyles, because of the fact that the commodities that we buy every day are part of the same chain or part of the same corporations that produce napalm and Agent Orange and all of that. So the line between some poor sailor on a Navy ship and you know, your average civilian in the United States is very, very thin. And so it's a really powerful story because you're trying to make all of us aware of our culpability and responsibility in war and that war is not something distant over the horizon. War is actually a part of our everyday lives. I don't think that was, that was published in 1980, I think. I don't think in, in the four decades ensuing that things have changed that much. If anything, things have gotten worse in the sense of, we're talking about the United States, our culpability as a nation in various kinds of horrific warfare. Um, and you've dedicated your life, uh, or at least the last few decades, to trying to counter that in various ways. I'm hoping you can talk more about it. For example, that you were running um, writing workshops with American veterans of the war in the post-war years. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what, what you hope those those writing workshops would accomplish. I can, I can imagine what you think writing accomplishes for you, but what did you think writing would accomplish for the, for other people when it came to things like war and peace and, and coping with those things? Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, started the uh, writing workshops for veterans uh, after uh, my house and neighborhood uh, burned down here in Oakland. Uh, which is now I 
look back on it, what that was about uh, 30 years ago we had this big fire in Oakland which uh, uh, after that fire was when they started uh, scientifically looking at uh, at fires and they called it a uh, a forest urban interface wilderness urban interface and uh, and now looking back out at 30 years later, it's part of this global warming and, and burning. Uh, so at that fire, my, um, my, uh, uh, the novel I was working on burned up also. And uh, so after that fire, I, it, it, the trauma was that I couldn't read, let alone write. And uh, so then I'm thinking about how am I, why don't I, um, why don't I start a writing group? And, uh, and, and so I could have support. I've always worked alone, but let me have some fellow writers around me and, uh, and we'll write together and see what happens. Uh, uh, see whether we can uh, come out of the trauma and, uh, and, and find our way through story, and um, and 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 so uh, I I gathered uh, uh, I I gathered uh, uh, veterans, and the idea came to me because it, it was around that same time that uh, Thich Nhat Han. Uh, the Vietnamese uh, Buddhist monk who, who just died, uh, he uh, gathered uh, veterans of the Vietnam War and he met North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, uh, the uh, uh, Viet Cong and Americans. And, uh, and I was at that retreat and uh, we, uh, uh, People meditated together. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh invented uh, hugging meditation, which he invented with Martin Luther King. And, uh, and he taught these former enemies uh, uh, hugging meditation. Uh, so, the, uh, and uh, we did uh, Buddhist meditation, uh, various kinds of rituals. And uh, so it was a uh, reconciliation uh, uh, exercise. Um, it was it was during that time that I I thought you know these people these veterans they need something else. I think they need an art, and so I I went on. Thich Nhat Hanh's retreats. And I taught a writing workshop within his retreats for veterans. And, uh, and that's been going on now for 30 years. And, um, and I, I, w what I believed is true. Uh, when one writes a story, uh, you, 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 you take, uh, the, the, you take conflicts, the worst conflicts that you know. Uh, this is Aristotle. This is what Aristotle taught about drama. Uh, the uh, great tragedy begins with conflict. And, uh, and you just let that conflict happen. Uh, let that war go on. And, uh, and then you... You, you go, you take that story further and further. Uh, and, and, and then there is a, this climax where the, and then there is uh, that consequences. And then writing with uh, understanding and with empathy and then there comes a reconciliation in the story. Uh, and there is resolution in the story. And there's understanding 
And uh, by the time you get to the end, uh, uh, the writer has become a different person. And, and, and if we're really good, whoever reads that story will become a different person. Uh, I have, at the beginning, you know, there, there were times when I'm not such a good teacher. And in fact, as a young person, I was not a good teacher. The way I put it to the veterans was, you've got to find a happy ending. And boy, they got mad at me. You know, they're not happy. Uh, we can't do that. You're, you're just a Pollyanna. Uh, and uh, we don't live happily ever after. Uh, but what I meant was keep going until you get to resolution and revelation. There are revelations that take place. Um, and, and having uh, reconciliation, uh, revelation, resolution, uh, that is happy. You know, I'm taking notes right now because I think you just gave me the ending of my third novel, the writing uh, <laughs> of the Sympathizer trilogy, okay? Okay, and so, so yeah, it, it, it took, what, 30 years, but I finally taught you something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're both writers now, and we, I think we both know how difficult writing can be, and it's a lifelong process, and each book sort of takes its own time to evolve. And I haven't started writing this third book, but the first two books were both acts of confession force writing. And then you just gave me the idea, because I wanted to put Thich Nhat Hanh in the third book so, in some way. And now you've given me this opportunity to figure out how to do that. Anyway, thank you so much for that. This will go down in history if I'm successful writing this third novel. Uh, but this is how I got my idea from Maxine Hong Kingston. So, <laughs> uh, now, fifth book of peace. Um, you know, so your, your, your manuscript burned down in the fire, uh, but then you did, you did recover. You did find resolution and revelation by, by continuing to write and, and, and writing this, this, uh, this very large novel, very powerful novel about Whitman's quest for peace uh, during these years of the war in Vietnam. And I think you've talked in, elsewhere about, you know, the fact that it's much easier, obviously, to write novels about war uh, or stories about war because there's built-in conflict, there's spectacle, and you know, cultures are used to war. We're used to war stories and we know what that looks like. Whereas um, what a peace story might look like is, is a bit harder to imagine. Especially when, when we go back to Chinamen, I mean, you could argue that there are many stories that are set in, in peacetime, but if we take brother in Vietnam, what we see is that even peacetime is not really peacetime. Peacetime is not peacetime if we're on a war footing, right? It's only peacetime for us, not for the people we're, we're, we're bombing. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, if what kind of wisdom that you've you, you've reached over, uh, how, w w is it possible to write then novels or stories about the peace struggle, if not about peace itself, about about anti-war stories that are not about war, you know, that don't center on soldiers and the, and the way they wrestle with war. That's a typical anti-war story that we, at least we have in the United States. I'm wondering, you know, what what besides Fifth Book of Peace, have you encountered other works that are works towards peace, works that are about the peace struggle, works that are anti-war that don't center soldiers and battles. I'm just wondering if you find any hope there in this kind of an uh, artistic move. I can't think of, uh, I can't think of that offhand. Uh, I do remember uh, having the idea that is it possible I guess I was thinking about Chekhov. You know, what was it he said? If if a gun appears in Act One, then it's got to go off by Act Three, something like that. I think I'm misquoting, but the uh, I, I have thought about that. Can I write a story that is dramatic but does not have violent conflict, it's very hard because even a, a verbal fight is also uh, violent uh, and hurts. Uh, uh, there were so many times in, in my writing in which I wanted to tell a truth. I, I wanted to tell truths, but truths were 
too dangerous. And, um, and so, uh, that's, uh, so what I would do is uh, uh, fool around and do, uh, change the structure of the story, uh, such as uh, through most of my writing, I wanted to protect my parents' uh, immigration status, uh, illegal. Uh, uh, and, um, and so, so I, I would change the structure and I would say, uh, here's what my, uh, my uh, legal father did. And, and then I would tell a legal story, which, which is very peaceful. And, uh, and then, but then, no, here's another way, but, but let's pretend that this happened. And, and then um, in, um, I can't remember whether it's Trip Master Monkey or, or, or uh, Fifth Book of Peace, but I have Whitman uh, sing hiding uh, AWOL soldiers and, uh, and things turn out okay. But the, I, I wrote it as fiction because in real life, I and my husband, we hid AWOL soldiers. Hmm. And, um, and I, I did not want to tell anybody that, uh, not just because I didn't want to get in trouble, but I thought the time will come again when I will need to hide people. And I don't want to let people know that I, I do such a thing. And so, so then I wrote it in fiction. So um, I was struggling with that, how to write a peace story. And, and I struggled and I, and I just wrote what I wrote and I don't know whether any of them came out that way. Uh, and, and all of my books, I've, I feel that I could not find an ending. And so all I could do was start the next book and I can't find the ending either. And I don't think that I've ever done it. <laughs> yes. You talked about the happy ending, you know, and um, I'm influenced by the philosopher Paul Ricoeur in his book, Memory, History, Forgetting, where he does talk about the happy ending uh, or a happy forgetting. And he says, we get, happy, we get to a happy forgetting when we reach justice. If we don't have justice, then we have an unhappy forgetting where the and past- you wrote happened. about forgetting also, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I think it's related, you know, in, in terms of like, how do we reach the happy, the, you know, the, the, the false happy ending is just sort of the artificial, well, let's just wrap the story up and you know wrap it up with a bow tie like like wrap it up in a bow like like hollywood does and of course we have another war that'll come a little bit later a genuinely happy ending is really really hard which is why i think you were saying it's been hard for you to find that ending that you're talking about maybe what happens in real life is that uh, we go through our lives we have our our hardships our suffering our happinesses and then each, and that happiness is temporary. And, uh, and then the next moment, there's an unhappiness that comes up. And that's real life. But in our writing, we could end it at any point. We could end it in the middle of a happy moment. You know, just that moment of watching the sun go down and the rainbow goes across the sky, the end. <laughs> you know, I, I, you, you talked about your parents, your mother and your father, and, and uh, I read all of your works. So I've never, I, I've never met your parents, but in, in some ways it feels to me just as an outsider to your, your situation that your parents live for me in, in these stories um, and in the stories you've told about them elsewhere, uh, you know, their responses to your work, for example. Um, 
and the tensions that, that are there in your work about what, it, what does it mean to tell a story about our loved ones, our family members, when these this act of writing is both a, an act of love and devotion, but also potentially an act of betrayal, as you've talked about in your writing as well. And it's really a tightrope that you've walked so brilliantly in uh, The Woman Warrior and Chinaman. I'm wondering if you've gone back and you know reread these books. I mean, Woman Warrior was 46 years ago, I think, when it when it came out. Uh, no, you haven't you haven't gone back, and that's a that's just a part of the past now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're saying about uh, my father being like your father, or or you could take him as a father figure. Uh, Notice that I call him the father, mm. not my father, but I write about him as the father. Uh, I, I was very worried about my parents reading my work. And, uh, and the, so I thought, well, it's really good. They, they can't read English. So, but then the Chinese translated it and I was really upset and nervous because uh, then they'll know what I wrote about them. And uh, uh, fortunately, the, the, the Chinese did a very quick translation. And I think the anger and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, especially anger at my mother, I, it, they softened it in the translation. And, uh, and so my parents thought, oh, this is, this is great. They like it. But as the years went on, I have a new code of ethics for myself. And uh, I, have did, I, I have decided that I uh, must not write about uh, uh, people uh, that are, I, I can't write other people's stories. It's their story. And I, I can't just assume that uh, they belong to me. And uh, so the, uh, the latest, my latest idea is that everything I write, I'm going to show it to people. In fact, I did that in um, the fifth book of peace. I wrote about the veterans and and I showed it to them, and um, and telling them, I I, it's a, I just wanted to know their reactions, and I would change uh, anything they they wanted. I I could leave them out if they, uh, the there were people some people who said I, I don't want my story in there, so I took it out. Um, and I do not feel censored. I, I just feel uh, that this is the right thing to do. Uh, but the best ones were people who, who told me I, I didn't get it right or I didn't go deep enough. And so they would just tell more. And uh, they, they gave me uh, so much. Uh, so, um, but, so yeah, it was that that I began uh, uh, writing in that way, uh, and um, and now when I think back, if I were to teach a, a writing class again, I would say to the students to uh, along with your writing, make a code of ethics, a writer's code of ethics for yourself, so you can write truly uh, and without hurting anybody. Oh, I think I'm reacting to two, I'm reacting to my parents. This is what happened. Uh, my Before he died, my father said to me, don't, don't hurt anybody with your writing. And my mother, my mother really bawled me out. Uh, I don't. I don't know what what she was reading. Maybe she was reading something about me, or maybe it was something that that uh, got to her. Oh, 
I know. I went to my mother's house and I, I tried to steal the, uh, the, the roll of, of paper, which was her cheat sheet for coming through immigration. And I stole it. And, uh, and she caught me. And then, and she was holding it and she's, she's yelling at me that I write about their immigration. And she's, and then she says, you know, everybody hates you. You know that, don't you? Everybody hates you and they hate your writing. And, uh, and she says, because you're telling, you're, you're telling about this and you're gonna get us all in trouble. We're all going to get deported. We're all gonna to go to jail. And, and so, but uh, you do notice that I began the woman warrior by saying, don't tell anybody my mother said, and then I blab. Uh, so, so that's the way I deal with that. Well, you know, this is a good place to wrap up our conversation you know, with what you're saying. I mean, part of, part of what you were talking about is is the, the the dangerous life that writers live. You know that 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 our stories are powerful and they they can save us. You know, but they're also threatening to certain people as well. Sometimes threatening to the powerful, sometimes threatening to the people that we love. But I do want to end by saying, you know, that opening line of of uh, the woman warrior that you just quoted. I teach the woman warrior every time I teach my Asian American literature class. I always make sure the students understand what's happening in that opening line, that it is uh, both giving voice to your mother, but also betraying your mother at the same time. And and that tension is there for so many of us as writers, particularly from immigrant or Asian American uh, kinds of families. Um, and in fact, in the memoir, I quote you at least twice, that one, that line, which wraps up the ethics of the writer for me. And then also another really important passage that I always make sure I wanna point out to the students, I think it's on page five of The Woman Warrior, where you say Chinese Americans, and you say this very specifically, you address Chinese Americans. When you think about you know, what, what parts of you are is, is Chinese culture and what part of you are the movies, how do you draw, how do you draw that distinction? And I think that's so true for me as a Vietnamese American. Like, I don't know what is true Vietnamese culture and what is Hollywood either. And, but what's really important in that, in that statement is that you directly address Chinese Americans. That is your audience. And that is so powerful of a move because I think we live in a, in, in a culture where, where obviously, you know, there's so-called majority, there's so, there so-called minorities and, and it's instilled in the so-called minorities to speak to the so-called majority. And, 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 and at least in The Woman Warrior, I think you explicitly reject that mm -hmm. by addressing fellow Chinese Americans. And I tell my students and I tell other writers, this is what we should be doing, what Maxine does here in The Woman Warrior by, by being aware of who our audience and community is and, 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 and prioritizing and, and being explicit about who our stories are for. And everyone else can listen in. It's not that other people, non-Chinese Americans can't read the, these books. It's simply that everyone else eavesdrops in on this conversation you're having with your fellow Chinese Americans. And I think that's the way it should be. And because you were true to that conviction from the woman warrior onwards, we've, we've been left with this incredible body of work. Um, and maybe the last thing I wanna say about that is, I don't know if you would agree with this, but you're one of the, I think, founding figures of Asian American literature, among other things, but one of the founding figures of Asian American literature. I think it was awfully lonely to be you in 1976 when The Woman Warrior came out. And now we're living at a time, uh, 46 years later, when literally every week there's a new book by an yeah, Asian American yes. writer. It's incredible. Yes, you know, I, I think so Woman Warrior many. is very good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And your work played a very important role in opening uh, the, the, the publishing marketplace, but also the imaginations of American re readers, but readers all over the world to what Asian American literature is. Uh, and that's really, it's really a global thing now because my work and the work of you and work of so many other Asian American writers are translated in many languages, published all over the world. And so the very idea of an Asian American, which was born here in the United States is now something that people in other countries can't understand. So I just want to, I'm thankful for being your student and for being a writer who benefited from the world that you helped to open up. Congratulations on this new volume from the Library of America devoted to your work, Maxine. Thank you, Viet.